All right, so I get to do my introduction. All right, Professor John Bailey is a working artist and a faculty fellow of FIU's Honors College since 2004. Professor Bailey has founded the Aesthetics and Values Project, an interdisciplinary curatorial program that has earned national recognition. He's been awarded two Excellence in Teaching Awards and a European Union grant for course development. Today, the good professor is joined by three distinguished student colleagues, or four, excuse me, that's right. <laughs> One who is able to uh, get an escape pass, a free escape pass, Juan Moreno. Did I say that correctly? Yay! <laughs> All right, Maya Castro, Susan Tapia, and Kirk Villalon. All right, take it away. Eric for uh, in, inviting me and letting me know about this conference and thank you Stephanie and Melissa all for helping me and inviting us here and welcoming us. I want to thank the four of them that um, have um, volunteered to come in to uh, really compliment and actually make this worthwhile for you because what I'm going to tell you about the, the project is um, really student centered. It's about uh, they essentially end up teaching the class, and it doesn't work without them. They would not work at FIU without these particular students and others making it happen. So, Joan, Maya, and Kirk, uh, and Susan, thank you. Um, I'm going to also ask them to interject whenever I, when I'm speaking uh, with their own thoughts. So, in such a short time, we have quite a bit to, to explain to you. And the most interesting part of it will be their experience and their impressions about it. So whenever you guys have a point, just uh, I have a tendency to ramble, so they can just cut me off and, and interject. Okay. So um, when you're ready to speak, just pick up one of the microphones. Okay. So um, in 2006, I was in my second year teaching in the Honors College. As Stephanie said, I'm an artist. I had initially declined the uh, invitation to teach in the Honors College because I didn't understand what Honors was. Interdisciplinary, critical thinking, you know, I'm a painter. That seemed just all kind of abstract and, and pointless. And then I went to this conference in, in Philadelphia and there was a session called Reacting to the Past that, was, uh, that had students like this and a, a, an instructor. And when I was in, you know, to be fair, conferences can be quite tedious. But this one, when I went into it, it, it came alive. So that the audience became part of the presentation and the students were at the heart of the presentation. And seeing how this came alive and then that there were actually game books that went with this to kind of implement this in different universities, I came back, I spoke to uh, Dean Leslie Northup and I said, let's give it a shot. And we did. And it's now um, a requirement of all second year honors classes. So let me just uh, briefly explain reacting to the past to you. Uh, reacting to the past, and actually I'm going to read it because it, it says it better than I can. It's been developed by this gentleman, uh, a professor of history named Mark Carnes at Barnard College in New York. And his uh, hope, his objective, is to have students engage classic texts in history so that they're not just passive learners or that, oh, this is something from long ago that's no longer relevant. So what he did is he developed these games to engage students with great ideas and classic texts. So pioneered by historian Mark Barnes, RTTP, reacting to the past, we go by that, has been implemented over 300 colleges and universities in the US and abroad. They do regional workshops, faculty workshops. It consists of elaborate games set in the past in which students are assigned roles informed by classic texts in the history of ideas. Class sessions are run entirely by students. Instructors advise and guide students and grade their oral and written work. It seeks to draw students into the past, promote engagement with big ideas, and improve intellectual and academic skills. Um, the, the different games that are taught, and I've brought game books that if anybody would like to borrow them, just returned them to me by, by August. There's a, there are game books and uh, 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 instructor handbooks. So there's uh, The Threshold of Democracy, Athens. Um, well, there's uh, one picture of, that's Danton from the French Revolution. This is a crowd rioting. Um, so there's Defining a Nation, India on the Eve of Independence. Uh, 
Henry VIII and the Refor Reformation Parliament, Patriots, Loyalists, and Revolution in New York City, the trial of Anne Hutchinson, Galileo, which is really popular with Pete Markowitz from the physics department. He loves this game. I hate it. Um, <laughs> Charles Darwin and the Copley Medal, the rise of nationalism, Confucianism. And this is the one that really um, myself and Professor Davis from the history develop department have developed over the last six years to really fit uh, not just a history class, but an honors college class, which tries to be interdisciplinary and hit many um, different issues. So, um, and you guys interject here, because this will be helpful. I'm gonna try to explain how a game uh, works for you, and it's gonna actually be perfect, although Eric's not here, that it comes right after his. So let's say we're playing a reacting to the past game. Um, usually the games are set far in the past because it's too difficult to play games about recent issues. So for example, you need students to assume historical roles. No student in my, because one time we had an idea, let's do the Cuban Revolution. And no student in Miami is, it's gonna be really difficult for them to be like, okay, I'll be Castro. You know, or if you play World War II, even that is too close because no student will convincingly play a, a Nazi. Uh, I played an apartheid game, and luckily I wasn't in the white supremacist group because those people couldn't even play. I mean, they felt so awkward saying it. But let's, for the sake of argument, we'll follow Eric's and we'll say, let's say gun debate in the United States. So we would break up students into different factions. You guys would be let's say, the Tea Party, and you can be Rand Paul. Just because, I'm yeah, all right? And then we would have moderate Republicans here, and you can be Lindsey Graham, right? All right? Then we would have uh, moderate Democrats, and um, I don't know who's a moderate Joe Democrat. Manchin. Joe Manchin, yeah, okay. And then we would have, well, there aren't enough of you. We'll be over here, and you guys would be, let's say, the radical Democrats, even there aren't that many. And you could be uh, Chuck Schumer from New York, and then we have people that aren't kind of in any faction. Uh, you could be, what's the senator from Maine, the independent guy? Yeah, it would be Ber Bernie Sanders. So you could be Bernie Sanders, which kind of goes around. And then we would, we would, the game would start, for example, right after the shootings in Connecticut in Newtown, right? Like that's what the kind of historical event that you want to pick. And then the debate starts about trying to make some type of gun legislation. Each, you have to be Rand Paul. I'm so ready. Yeah. <laughs> From the date that the game starts, right? And you have to advocate those positions. You need to be familiar with the events, with his positions up until that day. And you need to stay consistent with this philosophy, but you don't need to repeat history as it was uh, so that there's room for compromise. So obviously, though, you would have won yesterday. Yeah, you have a, okay, Kurt, yeah. What's most interesting since we do an Athens game prior, we do an Athens game prior, the professors kind of get to know the students, and then they'll give the students positions that are against what they personally believe. So yes. I was given essentially a communist and in the French Revolution, and uh, as someone who <laughs> is Cuban descent and really hates communists, to have to put yourself in that position and make those arguments is... No, <laughs> in fact, it did the opposite, but... It, <laughs> It makes, and you have to argue those positions as someone would of that persuasion. It, it's an interesting experience, and you get a completely new perspective. Tell the, the role that you were also. I was Danton. I was the radical revolutionary who wanted to overthrow the king, murder the king, to be honest, and uh, institute a commune and over Susan? all the friends. Uh, I was Omi Tegush, so I was a uh, first reported feminist. The Declaration of the Rights of Women. I was Camille de Moulin, so me and Danton worked really closely throughout the entire game. Until the last day. <laughs> I was Lafayette, the, the director of the National Guard. So with this class, is really interesting. So as um, John Bailey and Kirk have explained, that you were put into positions that you or ordinarily wouldn't take. Um, they really want to try to push you to the next level, so you're not comfortable, so you don't really like put yourself in a position where you're like, oh, I understand the material, you know, I can just you know be lazy about it and not go through it. But they really push you, and you have to. There's three different steps that you have to take. It's not only do you have to fulfill your own personal goals as like a character, you have to uh, follow what the whole class is going to. You can't just randomly shout out random things that are irrelevant to the situations that are happening. And you also have to please the teachers because in the end, it's still a game and it's still graded, and you still have to 
past certain things, so they really make it really difficult and really challenging. But in the end, you really get lost into the character, and some people um, really get lost into the character and feel that it reflects personal life, so a lot of people make it personal. But in the end, you really have to, it really puts things into perspective, how like, it is a class, it is a game, we're all friends in the end, you know, whatever stays in class is because my character might be like, the most anti-capitalist person there, but that doesn't mean that I'm gonna be like that the second I come out of class. So it's really confusing and it's really difficult, but in the end, you really gain a lot of knowledge from different point of, points of views. And I just wanna say one more thing. Um, Cause I not only push you out of your comfort zone uh, in regards to ideology, but also in regards to personality. Um, I'm, a little, I'm a little bit quiet and reserved, but being Olivia de Gouge, I had, I was a, I'm the first feminist, I have to be a little more radical, a little more loud. So definitely change, you know, pushes you. Yeah, we do that on purpose because it's an intellectual exercise. So we knew that Kirk was really conservative and we said, okay, let's make him radical. And what happened is that Yolanda's boyfriend, so he was off the yacht and he was like super with the king and I was divorced. Whenever we have couples in the class, we pit yeah. them against each other. It's really fun. So we play against each other a lot in the game, and many people think, oh, your boyfriend and girlfriend are going to get along, but no, we were totally at each other's but, throat in the game, and it was... But it, it's interesting, though, because... Um, Can you break his arm? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we, but we're giving lighthearted examples, but it's actually, it's really difficult for the students at times. So we have had female students that have to assume that women are emotional and inferior and cannot assume the same roles as males in society. And it's really hard for them to argue that position, but it's a great intellectual exercise. We have had African American students that have been slave owners in the game and have to argue against the abolition of slavery. And then comically once we had a Jewish student that was a Catholic priest in the class that <laughs> fell on her knees in front of the whole class and led everybody in a Catholic prayer. So the, these, we have comical things, but also personally, it's really challenging for the students. Um, it's important to point out in the grading and the assessment of this, that winning the game is not equal an A in the class. And being able to understand the intellectual, the philosophical ideas of the time, and advancing your character's position in an active and coherent manner is what determines a, a, a good grade. So almost every semester except this one. Yeah, go ahead. Just really quickly, the way that you would win the game is everyone, everyone's character, when you get something that's called a roll sheet, which is basically you get your name and who you are, a little bit of your backstory, it really falls on you to do all the research about your own character and actually everyone else's character because one way to get really sort of deep-seated into the game is to check out books about other people. And it, it, the more you learn about other people, the better you'll be able to maneuver yourself in the, in the National Assembly because it's really, you come and you kind of debate policy in there and it'll be, the context will shift, you know, back and forth. You have your own victory objectives that you're given that you have to try to get past in the Assembly or get such and such killed or whatever. But there's always a contextual sort of whirlwind that comes right before the course. For example, you know that you were set to debate slavery or something, and then Bailey will send you an email to the whole class actually and say, in San Domingue, there was, which is Haiti, there was a, a, a slave uprising and they killed 50% of the owners and they killed their children and stuff like that. So, yeah. It works through points, so each everyone has like 50 points, like 15 votes in like this, uh, the Congress that we have. So depending, let's say, um, like what he said, you're supposed to know a lot about your character. And also Davies doesn't help because he's like a genius when it comes to history, so he literally knows everything about like guns and like, you know, geography. So if you're wrong, you, he will let you know and that will could like really turn the game around. So besides, like, the king is the only one with like in the France study abroad, the king is the only one with 100 votes, like when, when we vote for no, Lafayette. Like, has Lafayette is, you know, Lafayette and the king. So I, had, I would have 50, Kirk would have 50, the crowd would have 50, so Oh, well, you know, the leader of the crowd would have 50. So then um, when it comes to votes, it's really crucial to have, like, alliances and coalitions it's just so that your, what you want gets through. And if you do something wrong, you get, you get votes taken out because you represent 50 people. So 50 people could die, which means you turn into another character. And, like, that's just going to really turn the game around really quickly. And what's yeah. most interesting about the game to me, and I'll just make two quick points, is 
when you have an issue that your character is not cut and dry on, on he's pro this or he's against this, there's no real answer, and you have to put yourself in the mind of the character. For example, Danton was a chauvinist, a womanizer, he loved prostitutes and stuff, but he also represented half the women in Paris, so you're, is he pro women's rights or is he against women's rights? So you have to put yourself in the mind of the character. And what I'll say is that as a history major, and somebody who's really passionate about history, this is such a great way for students to become active in history, and I think that's so important. And I think this is, I've had history classes where this type of study has been implemented, and it's always the same result. Students will delve themselves into character, understand the issues of the time as they were argued in the time, and you get a new understanding of history that not even I, who love the French Revolution, understood prior to this game. All right, let me, we only have a few minutes, so let me wrap it up. Um, so, um, some of the things that we've seen as a result of this, um, remember it started off in the class, and also, I never teach this class alone. You need to teach it with another faculty member. It's impossible to teach it alone. It's overwhelming. Um, and, but it's grown in the Honors College, uh, like I said, to every second year class, and I'll try to give you some reasons, although I won't speak for her, things that I think Dean North, of some of the reasons that she's implemented it. Um, well, first of all, to get students to read and reread and discuss classic texts as something that is a living uh, text, something that's relevant to their lives, we see this all the time, uh, especially with the social contract. Um, they engage history so that the French Revolution, for people that take this class, is something that they relate to. They relate to the characters, they understand it, and they see, for example, the birth of feminism. You know, you say the reason there are women Students in this class, that movement starts with Olympe de Gouges' character, the Declaration of Rights of Women. Uh, I don't have any pictures from FIU because we don't allow any video or pictures in the class because we have certain students that are arguing positions that if there was ever a video of it, forget it. Like they want to run for office. Can you explain this while you're advocating slavery here? You know, <laughs> so I had to download this from other universities. Um, public speaking, and not just public speaking. But public speaking where somebody telling you, you're wrong, you're wrong, you don't know your facts, these are the facts, this and that, answer for yourself. And so it's public speaking in a confrontational manner. I mean, Romney and Obama have nothing on these yeah. students. <laughs> it's, it's mild. Um, problem solving, uh, they've alluded to this, that you have your position, but you're not gonna, you're not gonna be able to just charge your position through. You need to learn about compromise and, um, and such. Critical thinking, so for, I love this picture. So this guy's a Hindu student, uh, village leader, but he's not a Hindu village leader. And so as I've said, they all have to take different positions. And that's really, I, I remember the African American student that was the secret slave owner. No one knew that she had a plantation in Saint-Domingue. She said how it, she wants to be a law student. And she says, I think this is the best training I've had. I find the position repulsive but having to argue it in a coherent manner is one of the best things for me. This is really something that's so significant. I, recently we had, we always get coffee after class, the faculty, because we have to discuss what happened and learn, you know, like decide, determine the outcomes. Sometimes I go back past the classroom an hour after and students are still hanging out together. No one walks out after class, they're there. Uh, we had a king once that lived in the dorm, she was walking home at 3 a.m. She saw a group of students sitting together. She wasn't thinking about it much. And then they said, oh, quiet, it's the king. And she looked, it was all the people in the class that wanted to kill her that were sitting together on the, on the green at 2, a, 2 or 3 a.m. Um, so for us, it's been great outcomes. Uh, I'd be happy to discuss it more with you. If you want to take a look at any of the game books, please feel free to do so. I have some instructor's manuals in here. I would ask you to guard those very safely if you want to borrow them because if any, for a student got their hands on that, it would undermine the teaching of the game completely. Um, why don't you guys close on the statement? Oh, well. Just so you know, we're all from different uh, majors. So I'm like an art history major. Yon graduated with an English major, with an English BA. Kirk is history, history and Susan is IR, like international relations and political science. So we don't come from the same background academically. So that's really difficult. So like, let's say if you have an aspiring lawyer, um, they'll look at it away differently, like a certain situation differently than how I would. I would look at it in a totally different way. So you really learn to like combine your strengths through like your majors 
and it really is like very vital to how you understand history and you see like the different perspectives and like how one thing aids and how one thing hinders like your progress. So it's really interesting because it's not everyone in the same boat. I'll just close on a quick personal statement. Um, my personal statement to law school was about this class about the trial of the king and it basically started, I knew I wanted to be a lawyer at the trial of Louis the Sixteenth. And that was something that all three of, all four of us actually yeah, took an active part in. And uh, I got in so clearly. Cool. Oh. I want to thank the four of us for coming in. That was really special. That's true. Sorry. No, we, once you enter into the classroom, it has to be whatever the date is. And if anybody speaks out of character in that sense, they're considered insane and they lose delegates because they're considered crazy. <laughs> also, whenever we have a guest come into the class, so for example, uh, President Madi came once and I think he was Thomas Jefferson visiting from the United States or something. Like, you always have to have characters in the classroom, but they always have that time before and after class. And that's why they stay so long together. You have the opportunity to like talk to your teachers, like to Davies or to Bailey, just to like reconfirm that what you're doing is okay. They're not gonna necessarily tell you like do this, do that, because that's not like that's not the deal. Like you have to figure out yourself because you're the student. And you're, this is a great it's honors, but they'll definitely guide you. And like Davies, who's a genius, he will definitely like help you. Like okay, this is what happens. You know, this is really just saying. We all know. Yeah. So, so, it's, <laughs> so it's it's so it's really useful because then you kind of see if you're really lost, they'll definitely like help you and see like okay, this is like a good path taking just go that route and see what happens and there's always an end of the semester assessment where you do it as a class that's today in my class yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and one more thing at the end of at the end of the semester we also have a little potluck and you know make up with each other yes yeah, so <laughs> today is the last day of the semester for this semester's reacting class we're having a french potluck where we tell them their fates in the long term and things like that <laughs> oh, yeah. about like how the game works the actual game moves forward chronologically through the semester right yes and uh, as uh, Maya alluded to we as professors slash game masters we will give them news bulletins because anything that happens after the date that the game starts at is not set, has not happened unless we as game masters say it has so we send them news bulletins about there's been an uprising in Saint-Domingue the Austrians have sent the declaration of Pilnitz saying they are concerned about the French king. They are threatening military action. So it gives them context. And we also do things like Mozart delivered this piece in Vienna. Yeah. The metric system was adopted. So they get to see this happen in the Americas, things like that. All right, thank you.